A very close friend of mine made me aware of this video by Matthew Vine. It turns out that it's a YouTube video and a book called God and the Gay Christian. In both the video and the book, several scriptures from God's Word, the Bible, are re-examined and then used to form an argument for homosexuality being no longer labeled a sin. Now there are a number of practicing homosexuals and other activists who are not atheists, they say they believe in God, but they argue that the Bible legitimizes general homosexual behavior. Their core argument is that the Bible has been misunderstood and misinterpreted where homosexuality is concerned. So we're going to go through this video, we're going to play through it and see what we find. I'll be stopping as we go along the way. Uh, I will put a link to the video's original video in the description. So let's play the video and see what we find. Marriage equality is on the rise. But despite this trend, religious beliefs remain a major obstacle to acceptance. Many conservative Christians believe that the Bible condemns all same-sex relationships. That question drove my own intensive study of this issue when I came to terms with being gay. As both my parents and my church in Kansas believed that gay marriage was wrong. But what I learned when I studied the relevant scripture passages changed my parents' minds, along with the views of many other Christians in my life. I just want to take a moment to stop and say that as we've gotten to this point in the video, it's very well shot. You can tell it's been well produced. It's well edited. And at the very beginning, it's showing a picture of Proverbs 18.15, which says, The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. So this young man is interested in knowledge and learning, as shown by the inclusion of Proverbs 18.15, and his statement just there on how he was driven to study and learn more. Now, being driven to study and learn more is a good thing. As a matter of fact, I would say he could benefit from digging just a little bit deeper and studying more. As we are about to hear, he has discovered some new information, as in a new way to look at certain scriptures. Well, he came to that conclusion after study. So, my natural follow-up question would be, what if by doing additional study, you were to come upon a different answer than the one you are about to give? Would you, or those who follow your thinking, be willing to change your stance? Were you really seeking God's truth, or were you looking for a way to rationalize on how you felt, and you've simply found a way to make the Word of God say what you want it to say? Just a thought. We'll get back to the video now. Oh, and just before we get back to the video, I do want to mention that the very first set, he's going to mention six points from God's Word. The very first one, he doesn't mention exactly what it is, so unless you're watching the video, you wouldn't know that it's Genesis 19. So he's about to, to mention that he studied the relevant scripture, um, which he lists six different scriptures. And so I'm not sure if he thinks that that's all the scripture that's relevant to this issue, but those are the six that he, he gives six. And we'll go through those point by point too. But just so you know, it's Genesis 19 that he's about to talk about. But, uh, by the way, homosexuality is mentioned more than six times in the scripture. Uh, but like I said, we'll come back to that. Uh, let's hear uh, some of these examples that he's talking about. There are six passages in the Bible that refer to same-sex behavior. Three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. The most famous passage is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends two angels disguised as men into the city of Sodom where the men of Sodom threatened to rape them. The angels blind the men, and God destroys the city. For centuries, this story was interpreted as God's judgment on same-sex relations. But the only form of same-sex behavior described is a threatened gang rape. Ezekiel 16.49 sums up the story's focus on violence and hostility towards strangers. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. So if we were to leave it at what was just said, that's the end of his first point, which is Genesis 19. If we were to leave it as what was just said, uh, it makes it sound like Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were punished for everything but homosexuality, and the only connection to homosexuality that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had was this event where 
the angel of the angels of the Lord were being uh, threatened with gay rape. Now it's important to know that that lots of things are left out here. Sodom and Gomorrah are first mentioned in Genesis 10, and eventually Lot goes there in Genesis 13. And in Genesis 13:13 13, 13, it says, "Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord." So there's one example that we already know that Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked and great sinners against the Lord. We also see in Genesis 18 verses 20 through 21 where it says, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. And Genesis 19:13, where it says, For we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So it's very clear that there's more things going on here than just the gay rape that God knew already that Sodom and Gomorrah uh, was an evil city full of all kinds of different wickedness, homosexuality one of them. In light of these passages, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Was it homosexuality? Well, I mean, we do get the term sodomy from Sodom. That term came to be used to refer anal sex between two men, whether consensual or forced. Clearly, homosexuality was part of why God destroyed those two cities. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to perform homosexual gang rape on the two angels who were disguised as men. At the same time, and this is important, it's not biblically accurate to say that homosexuality was the exclusive or only reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were definitely not exclusive in terms of the sins in which they indulged. Now he also mentions Ezekiel 16.49, but he leaves out Ezekiel 16.50, the verse that comes right after. I'd like to read both those to you. Because Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50 declares, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Now please listen, this is important. The Hebrew word translated detestable refers to something that is morally disgusting and is the exact same word used in Leviticus 18:22 that refers to homosexuality as an abomination. So we have a link between something that we clearly know is saying that homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord and the same terminology being used in Ezekiel to describe Sodom and Gomorrah is being used in Leviticus 18.22. Similarly Jude 7, uh, there's only one one book in Jude, but the verse seventh verse declares Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. So again, while homosexuality was not the only sin in which these cities indulged, it does appear to be the primary reason for the destruction of the cities. Those who attempt to explain away the biblical condemnation of homosexuality sometimes use Ezekiel 16.49 to claim that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitable, being inhospitable. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah certainly were being inhospitable. I mean, there's probably nothing more inhospitable than a homosexual gang rape. But to say God completely destroyed two cities and all their inhabitants for being inhospitable clearly misses the point. God destroyed those cities because of their wickedness, including but not limited to homosexuality. And remember, Abraham implored God and eventually asked God to spare the cities if he could find just ten righteous people living there. Obviously he couldn't. Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction serves as a warning about unchecked sin and the consequences of sin and wickedness when they are confronted by a righteous and just God. Now let's look at the uh, next section here which is Leviticus uh, 18.22 and then he'll go to Leviticus 20.13. In Leviticus 18.22, male same-sex intercourse is prohibited, and violators are to receive the death penalty. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Other things called abominations in the Old Testament include having sex during a woman's menstrual period, eating pork, rabbit, 
or shellfish, and charging interest on loans. But they're part of the Old Testament law code, which was fulfilled by Jesus. Hebrews 8.13 says that the old law is obsolete and aging. Romans 10 verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law. So the Old Testament doesn't settle the issue for Christians. So here we have Leviticus 18.22 and, and, and 20.13, and these Old Testament laws are commonly used by opponents of the Bible to try and catch Christians being hypocrites by choosing to eat seafood and pork on one hand, but refusing to allow homosexuality on the other. Something made clear throughout scriptures is the difference between the moral law and the ceremonial law. The moral law is the stuff found in the Ten Commandments, like you shall have no other gods, or do not murder, or do not commit adultery, and other commandments throughout Scripture, like the ones Paul mentions in Romans. Now the ceremonial law is found mostly in the book of Leviticus, and it includes rules that the Israelite people were called to observe, such as do not eat pork, do not eat shellfish, do not, uh, or, or those who commit homosexual, uh, homosexual acts must be stoned to death. Now, the Bible also teaches that the moral law and the ceremonial law have two different purposes. In Romans 5, for instance, the moral law is there to show us our sins. To show us our sins. So we can see our need for Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. And since we are all sinners, and we all need to have our sins set before us, so we see our need for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, the moral law still applies today. Now, in places like Exodus 19, we see that the ceremonial law was to mark the Israelites as God's holy people, and the ones from whom the Messiah would eventually come. This would have an effect on the way they worshipped, ate, practiced justice, dressed, and so on. They were meant to be a people set apart by God for God, and through whom the Savior of the world would come. So, when that Savior finally came in the form of Jesus Christ, the purpose of the ceremonial law was fulfilled. So in the same way you don't need to advertise by hanging up posters for a concert after it has already happened, after Jesus was born, died, and rose again, it was no longer necessary to follow the ceremonial law. This is also why in Acts 10, God tells Peter that now all animals are considered clean, and the Gentiles who didn't follow the ceremonial law of the Israelites we're now welcome into the Christian faith. Now some people will say, hey wait, if what you say is true, then you can't condemn homosexuality because it was under the ceremonial law, like the other things mentioned in Leviticus, and you just said those things no longer apply. Okay, let's clear that up too. Imagine two circles, or you can even draw them on a sheet of paper. One represents the moral law, and the things it forbids, and the other is the ceremonial law and the things it forbids. Now imagine or draw those two circles overlapping each other in the middle. In other words, many of the things forbidden in the ceremonial law are also forbidden in the moral law. So when the ceremonial law was fulfilled through Jesus Christ, that circle goes away or gets erased. So we were, for instance, no longer required to punish homosexuality by stoning according to the ceremonial law. However, homosexuality itself remained sinful because it was still covered underneath the moral law, and that circle is still there and still applies. This is why Paul talks about how we are free to eat whatever we like. We are nonetheless forbidden from taking part in sexual immorality, including, but not limited to, homosexual acts. Now he also mentions Hebrews 8.13 and Romans 10.4. Do those two verses say what he is implying they say? Hebrews 8.13 says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And he's talking about Jesus. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now I want to point out, there's another verse he may have missed. It's Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18, where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law 
until it is all accomplished. These verses are referring to how Jesus has fulfilled the old ceremonial or Mosaic law. He perfectly followed the laws and therefore was perfect and without sin. Because he was without sin, he could be the sacrifice for us. He who knew no sin died for us who were sinful. Jesus did what we could not. He was born of a virgin. He lived a spotless, perfect life. He died on the cross and rose again. Once that was done, the old way of being made righteous passed away. And it is obsolete because now faith in Jesus is the new covenant. In the same way, Jesus is the way to righteousness to everyone who believes in him. This is why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and why no one gets to the Father except through him. Now we'll move to Romans 1, verses 26 through 27, which is what he brings up next. Let's look to the New Testament, which contains the longest reference to same-sex behavior in the Bible. In Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, people who turn away from God to worship idols are then turned over to their own lusts and vices. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul's words here are clearly negative, but the behavior he condemns is lustful. He makes no mention of love, commitment, or faithfulness. His description of same-sex behavior is based solely on a burst of excess and lust. In the ancient world, same-sex behavior mainly occurred between adult men and adolescent boys between masters and their slaves, or in prostitution. Most of the men engaged in those practices were married to women, so same-sex behavior was widely seen as stemming from out-of-control lust, a vice of excess, like gluttony or drunkenness. And while Paul labels same-sex behavior unnatural, he says in 1 Corinthians 11.14 that for men to wear their hair long also goes against nature and most Christians interpret that as a reference to cultural conventions. In now, although the focus here is only on verses 26 and 27, I would like to expand that for more clarity and read Romans 1, 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, and the birds and the animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women, and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, and receiving in, in themselves the due penalty for their error. And see, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decrees, they that they, those who practice such things, deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, let me ask you, does Paul's passage in Romans 1 condemn homosexuality or not? Or is he just talking about unnatural homosexuality 
and homosexual acts with children, or those done out of lust and not love. We're going to go into some detail here because this is a, an important section that I want to make sure we get right. So let's look at Romans 1. Now Paul most likely wrote this letter to the Romans from Corinth, which was a city that was widely known for its sinful sexual practices. In chapter 1, after making a number of introductory remarks, the Apostle turns his attention to the consequences that come from rejecting God and God's truth. Paul says each person innately or naturally knows there is a creator. He makes a subtle defense for God's existence by saying God's divine fingerprints are all over creation, so no one can say they were unaware of the creator. All are without excuse. That's what that means. Paul's statements here echo Psalm 19, which says, The heavens are telling of your glory, O God. And the expanse is declaring the work of your hands. Day to day pours, out, pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. A couple wrong buttons there. But unfortunately, says Paul, humanity has rejected God's truth. The apostle describes how humankind has exchanged the naturally given worship of the true God for the unnatural and the false worship of idols. Many things can be an idol. It doesn't just have to be a golden calf. It can be ourselves, our own dreams, our own wants, our own desires. We ourselves can be an idol. The connection between the list of idols Paul gives and in the classes of creation described in Genesis 1, 20 through 25 is definitely not by accident. That might be something you want to look into, too, for just for fun. Neither is the obvious link between Paul's use of the words image and form and the well-known statement in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So back to the point. Because of this rejection, Paul says there are two broad judgments laid down by God. Three times in Romans, Paul says that God gave them over to sin. And three times he says that the end results were that the people exchanged a good thing for something sinful which served as their punishment. Now here's a side note. We often think that when we sin and nothing happens, no, no lightning bolt strikes, that God either didn't care or didn't notice. However, Roman, Romans 1 tells us a different story. It tells us that the first stage of God's wrath is actually not to discipline or correct the person openly, but rather he abandons the individual, giving them up to their sin. His initial wrath and judgment results, as Paul says, in their receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. That's verse 27. Now in verse 24, Paul makes the initial mention of the first judgment, a sexual sin that is a consequence of the rebellion that we mentioned earlier. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. The reading of this text is unmistakable. God delivered the people over to sexual lust. The word impurity in Greek literally means immorality, a state of moral corruption, a kind that resulted in their bodies being shamed. What kind of moral corruption and shame, you might ask? Well, Paul tells us that God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural functioning of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. There is no mistaking Paul here. The reference is clearly to the practice of lesbianism and male homosexuality. The second judgment is one that also results from the people not acknowledging God and his truth, and that's a corrupt mind. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. You can read the rest of that. Romans 1, 28-31. In summary, Romans 1, 18-31 deals with the fact that God has innately made himself known to humanity, but he has been rejected and replaced by other objects of worship, including sometimes people worship themselves, their own beliefs more than God. There's many different types of idols. Because of this, God has delivered two judgments, one of the homosexual behavior and another of an immoral mind, each of which demonstrate his abandonment and wrath towards humanity's rebellion. A quick look at the present state of the world validates that these judgments continue 
to be handed down by God today. Now in the video, he also mentions young children. When the argument about this text only referring to children comes up, we're not going to spend much time on that because we can quickly dispense with it since Paul does not mention children at all, ever, in regards to this, but instead specifically says men with men committing indecent acts, verse 27. So we know that he's not just referring to men committing indecent acts with women. Now let's briefly visit the, the last argument he makes, that Paul is not condemning natural and loving homosexual relationships in, in Romans 1. Paul's argument is that when people abandon God and his ways to any unnatural worship, God can abandon them to the lusts in their hearts and the unnatural sexual practice of homosexuality. Just as creation is clearly seen, leaving the unbeliever without excuse, we saw that in verse 20, it is also plain or clear from the way that God made human bodies how sex should naturally be carried out. Man complements woman and vice versa. This is true anatomically, physiologically, and, psychology, or, and psychologically. Genesis 1, 27 through 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created him. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. It's hard to fulfill that commandment, and be fruitful and multiply, if you can't have children. And the only way to have children is a union between a man and a woman. Genesis 9.1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. So, what Paul is doing is he's making an argument of what is natural and what is unnatural. The Apostle is arguing that just as God created humanity in a natural way, to know and acknowledge him as the creator versus any false deity or idol, he created humanity to innately know and acknowledge natural sex as true and not homosexuality. Just as idolatry is contrary to what God intended when he created humanity, so too homosexuality is contrary to nature in that it does not represent what God intended when he made men and women with the physical bodies that have a natural way of interacting with each other and a natural desire for the opposite sex. Lastly, he does mention uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 14. Uh, this is a, a brought up to point out what Paul says about long hair. And the point that's trying to be made is to say, hey, Paul said long hair in a man was bad. And long hair is accepted now in culture. And now homosexual, homosexuality is accepted in culture too. So therefore we have an example of where it's okay to change things in the Bible when the culture changes, right? First off, the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is our source of absolute truth. For as long as it has been around, it has been attacked relentlessly, but here it still stands. God protects his word and will make sure it accomplishes what he sets it out to do. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible are we given permission to change its contents based on culture. And if you start to do that, where do you stop? What happens when murder is culturally acceptable? Oh, wait, that's a bad example. It already is, because sadly I forgot about abortion. But I hope you see my point. If you allow God's word to be changed by man, that it no longer remains God's word. It would become man's word. So after all that said, is, is that what Paul is really saying in 1 Corinthians 11, 14? If you want the full context, go ahead. For In the interest of time, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but for context, read 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 15, and I would encourage you to do so. But it's clear, uh, to clear this up, it helps to know that context and it helps to know that the Corinthian church was in the middle of a controversy about the roles of men and women and the proper authority and order of the church. In the Corinthian society women showed submission to their husbands by wearing a veil. It seems that some of the women in the church there were discarding their veils, something that only pagan temple prostitutes or other rebellious women would do. If women in the church were taking uh, were taking off their veils, it was the same as a woman dishonoring her husband. 
as well as it would have been culturally confusing. By the same token, for a man to wear a veil or sometime somehow have his head covered during worship was not culturally acceptable in Corinth and would have added to the confusion. So Paul is referring not to just cultural standards here, but also to the importance of honoring the roles that God has laid out for us. Paul appeals to biology to illustrate the appropriateness of following cultural standards. Women naturally have long hair, longer hair than men, and men are much more naturally prone to baldness. That is, God created women with a natural veil and men with an uncovered head. If a woman spurns the mark of her submission, which is the veil, she may as well shave her head. His point is that if the culture says a woman should not be bald or going without her natural covering, then why would she reject the same culture standard of wearing a veil or going without her covering, her cultural covering? For the man's part, it's unnatural for him to have long hair. His hair is naturally shorter and thinner than the woman's. This corresponds to the Corinthian tradition of men not wearing a head covering during worship. So now, while hair length is not the main point of this scripture, we glean the following applications from it. One, we should adhere to the culturally accepted indicators of gender. Th these are the main points. We should adhere to the culturally accepted indicators of gender. Men should look like men, and women should look like women. God is not interested in, nor does he accept, unisex. The other point is that we should not rebel against the culture just for the sake of rebelling, in the name of some sort of Christian liberty. It doesn't matter how we present ourselves. Also, women are to voluntarily place themselves under the authority of men in the church. We should not reverse the God-ordained roles of men and women, and that's what was going on in the Corinthian church, and that's what Paul's addressing by using natural and unnatural illustrations. He's talking about how we should not try and reverse God's naturally ordained roles of men and women. Let's get on to the uh, last portion here. Last two likely references to same-sex behavior in the Bible. Two Greek words, malakoi and arsenikoitai, are included in lists of people who will not inherit God's kingdom. Many modern translators have rendered these terms as sweeping statements about gay people. But the concept of sexual orientation didn't even exist in the ancient world. Yes, Paul did not take a positive view of same-sex relations. But the context he was writing in is worlds apart from gay people in committed, monogamous relationships. The Bible never addresses the issues of sexual orientation or same-sex marriage. So there's no reason why faithful Christians can't support their gay brothers and sisters. It's time. So that's the end of the video, and the Bible does address those things. Um, we're going to get to that here as we go through it, but I just want to, you know, if, you're, if you heard that and, and that really stood out to you, I want you to know that the Bible does address those things. But first, uh, let's finish off what the last thing he was talking about before he got to the ending there. The last two verses on this video um, are 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10. And it's interesting that they are not read aloud or uh, written out on the video, yet they are called sweeping statements against homosexuality. So I'm going to read both of them for you now. Once I get done reading these, you'll probably understand why they weren't included in the video. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, and I've included verse 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And 1 Timothy 1, uh, 10 through 11. The sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I think those are really strong negative verses that, that attack homosexuality from God's perspective. Now, because of the Greek words that he brought up, um, in both these verses are where he's pointing out um, where there's trouble 
we're dealing with translations and the unpacking of that can be very long so I'm gonna put a link uh, to two different articles in the description uh, section of this video uh, one for each one of those verses and uh, so you'll see that in the information below I would encourage you to check that out so you can get the entire response uh, to what the video claims about those two individual passages and at the end there the video went on to say that the God's Word doesn't comment on sexual orientation or on the committed homosexual relationships but the scripture we outlined would disagree with that there's no mention of those types of relationships in God's Word but that's because if God sees all homosexuality as a sin then you would not find those types of examples anywhere in his word also there is a bold claim that makes it sound like those six verses are the only ones that are relevant to this discussion there are many other verses in God's word the Bible that address homosexuality God's approved form of relationships between a man and a woman sexual immorality and more that were left out of the video some but not all being the following Genesis 2 18 through 25 I'm gonna read that one because I think that one's so pertinent this is this is talking about um, where the he was just got done saying that nowhere in the in the Bible does it talk about relationships or sexual orientation sure it does Genesis 2 18 through 25 then the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him a helper fit for him now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept he took one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There you go. How about that for an, an indication on what God believes uh, in relationships what God wants in sexual orientation maybe you're saying well that's Old Testament okay Matthew 19 4 through 6 where Jesus himself says have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh what therefore God has joined together let no man separate there's other verses that are relevant too, like 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Pretty much all of Ephesians 5. Galatians 5, verses 16 through 21. Uh, Revelation 21, 8. Again, a warning. That one says, but, for the, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Sexual immorality is... Include, that includes homosexuality. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 9, 1. 2 Corinthians 12, 21. Acts 15, 29. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50, which we read earlier. 2 Peter 2, 5 through 10. I think that's a good one to read, too. 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 verses 5 through 10 if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extin extinction making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly and if he rescued righteous lot greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented his righteousness soul, his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. 
bold and willful. They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. So see, there's, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Those are just a few verses that talk about these things. In the end, the evidence used by uh, proponents of homosexuality uh, to say that the Bible is disapproving only of specific homosexual behaviors or specific uh, homosexual behavioral types in general fail when they're analyzed against the actual text of both those six scriptures that were used in the video as well as the other verses that we just listed out above. No gymnastics of the interpretation, no argument of how certain words of the original language don't mean what they mean in our translations will ever make the text fit the homosexual lifestyle. You simply cannot make something the Bible calls a sin not a sin because you don't want it to be. If homosexual uh, behavior is a sin in the eyes of God and you believe that it is not, what you believe won't matter in the end. Paul makes this clear in another letter of his where he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. All that will matter in God's truth and the truth about the consequences of homosexual behavior. Believe me when I say that I desperately don't want you to experience that end. Instead, let how Paul finishes his thought in the 1 Corinthians letter be true of you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where it says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. It is my hope and prayer that you will consider what's been presented here, that you will seek God's will and pray to him and ask him to reveal his truth to you. God bless you.